Mm. No, I'm I'm not the sharing type, you know. So um, I could tell you a story. I could tell you a story uh, that I haven't told anyone for 28 years, and uh, it's probably a story that doesn't make me look particularly good. Um, but it's a story related to a to an album to a band. And I guess it's a story that you may find interesting. But uh, actually, up until the very last moment, I was not sure if I really want to do that. But um, maybe I caught your attention now and you are happy now that you haven't switched off the video 20 seconds ago. <laughs> because uh, maybe now something interesting is happening. Well, let me get the particular album in question first. All right. Yeah, so as I said, I haven't told this, I haven't talked with anyone about this for almost 30 years. Um, yeah, let me tell you a story. So, um, first let me show you the album I'm talking about. Uh, let's put this here. The album I'm talking about is called Something is Coming by the British underground phenomenon Death in June. So uh, this record here particularly came out in the first half of the 90s and uh, it actually was released uh, in the midst of the Yugoslavian war, the Balkan war. And um, this was a war that kind of fragmented the Balkans. There was war between Serbia and Kosovo and Croatia and Bosnia. And um, Douglas Pierce, the guy behind Death in June, kind of took a pretty clear stance in that situation. And uh, as you can see by the emblem behind him, um, kind of assume the side of the Croatians. And uh, he went actually to Zagreb and recorded there this album. It was kind of like the first, the first musical outfit that uh, came to Croatia in the war. And um, they played a few concerts and then they went to the local radio station. And there they recorded uh, the other part uh, of what's, what you can hear on this album. So this is mostly kind of a very melancholic, very misanthropic, uh, very dystopian folk music. Um, yeah, um, now I'm just, to tell you the story, I, I'm trying to set up the stage for the events to unfold. Now, um, me personally, I went out of the 80s quite disappointed as far as mainstream music goes. So. Something about the 80s was really vibrant and fascinating and I was quite happy to be part of it. But honestly, when I was listening to the music that was kind of leading into the 90s and when the 90s finally came, I basically mostly threw up in my mouth all the time. And this may sound a little bit unfair, but honestly, if you, imagine, if you, if you just think for a second about the fact that in hindsight the two biggest acts uh, of the 90s uh, were Guns N' Roses and Nirvana, then uh, this is actually a statement enough about how shabby and how boring <laughs> this whole music industry had become and I was really completely disgruntled with that and for me the only redeeming aspect of the 90s is uh, the ex existence of uh, techno and dubstep and acid jazz and all those things that I started to listen in the late 90s but what I did first when the 90s arrived was to go entirely underground so around around 1990 I stopped listening to any kind of mainstream music for at least six years nothing I only listened to projects and to albums that had been produced in units never bigger than thousand or two thousand uh, uh, pieces and uh, mostly we are talking about tapes that had been released in the amount of 50 or 60 cassettes. So um, I became 
completely immersed in the underground world. And around 1991, I think, I started to run a little um, kind of mail order, if you want to call it that way. But mostly I was like selling tapes and CDs and seven inches basically from the back of the car, from the, from the car trunk. And um, I guess I started the, the, mail over, the mail order only because I wanted to get my hand on the kind of wholesale catalogs of all these labels. And uh, I thought if I sell some of these units on the site, it's still my biggest benefit of the whole affair will be that I can buy all this music much cheaper because I can kind of order uh, certain amounts of it and, and just keep always one one uh, unit for myself in my archive and uh, not long after that I had uh, met Stefan and Stefan was living in Re Regensburg I was living in Munich uh, we were kind of similar in terms of musical taste although I probably gravitated more towards kind of the uh, dreamy folky sound while he was certainly much closer to kind of an aggressive industrial music but um, yeah the idea was born that we should start a label and uh, so uh, it was actually me who came up with the name for the label and we called it Ant Zen which was just an abbreviation of the German word anti-censur, anti-censorship which was maybe a little bit goofy because uh, there wasn't really anybody trying to censor us uh, we were kind of these typish, typical West German kids that tried to pretend like they're constantly being harassed by the authorities, but uh, we kind of weren't. I wouldn't say it took off, uh, but it became kind of a established little thing, little label within this ultra underground community. We started to release tapes first and uh, we always took a lot of time to kind of design the covers and there was always all kind of graphic material added to the box and stuff like that. And um, just one year later we kind of had this idea that to establish ourselves a little more we should definitely uh, start to organize concerts. This actually had a somewhat a reason because we felt like in the south of Germany where we lived there seemed to be a quite a demand for this kind of underground concerts but bands only very rarely came that far south which makes sense because if you are a underground band um, on a tight budget um, you, if you come to Germany you want to play Hamburg you want to play Cologne you want to play Berlin you want to play Amsterdam but to make the big jump to Munich it's you have to cross the entire country and so oftentimes we were left out when these bands were traveling through Europe so we thought yeah, that's the idea. We invite them ourselves and organize everything and that way everybody gets to see these bands. So we, when we started doing that, um, this was uh, just us organizing concerts for our buddies. So at the beginning we had really very small acts, people just we knew personally. The reason why this actually worked was because we had a quite a strong grip on the local gothic scene and um, so we were able to organize a concert where 90 minutes to maybe two hours were reserved for the stage act but after that we did a party and you know those gothics back in the day they wanted to dance so as long as there was a big kind of disco event after that disco I mean with a, all kind of uh, gloomy creepy music of course and one big stroboscope <laughs> doing this for two hours but um yeah, we were quite successful. Even with small bands uh, playing, we kind of assembled 300, 400 people, which uh, wasn't that bad for a entirely underground-oriented event. So we did that for actually exactly 13 months. Now, just a little side note. Um, of course, when we started to make these concerts, we had uh, uh, we have been looking for a location for proper venue that was kind of fitting our needs. On the one hand it couldn't be anything too posh because this was just about kind of dirty music by dirty musicians with dirty instruments and you wouldn't want to rent some expensive high-end uh, concert room for that. So uh, we are looking for the perfect balance. At the same time we didn't want to do it in some kind of garage. So we find a place called Backstage and Backstage was ran by two people 
whose name were um, her name was Brigitte and I think his name was Hans Peter. Now they were really kind of characters that we had a hard time to um, come to terms, but we did it anyway because in those days in Munich the choice of venues was not that big, uh, particularly because uh, kind of the whole rave and techno scene just hit five years later, six years later. Six years later there were just tons of new halls built at the suburbs of Munich and you could just rent whatever you wanted. But um, in those in this one year when we did our concerts um, it was much harder to find a really good place and um, so we kind of accepted uh, all the terms that uh, Hans Peter and Brigitte had uh, thrown at us and it was kind of interesting because they were these very um, dedicated uh, to leftists that uh, couldn't stop talking about about Antifa and uh, and how they hated everything that's fascist and how uh, this and that but at the same time there were this really 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 horrible ultra capitalist that kept squeezing us out of money all the time really awful i mean uh, i kept calling them uh, ultra capitalist marxists and they were this kind of people that were running barefoot in the summer through the city do you, you you know the type probably kind of with a batik trousers and uh, I always I always felt it's awkward when somebody is barefoot in a kind of major capital, so I never felt that they were very supportive, but they really liked to cash in the rent. They were really good at that. Yeah, so I hope you are still there. I'm kind of circling around the issue slowly and um, kind of leading you <laughs> to the actual story. So. This might have been the underground, but even the underground has somewhat a pyramid-shaped structure. And uh, there are just bands that are kind of your buddies because you see them every other weekend somewhere in a club. And there are those bands that you know, or know only from records and you think like, wow, what if we could get those? Wouldn't that be amazing? So for us, kind of the top of the pyramid was uh, to manage to create, to organize a concert with either current 93 Death in June or Sol Invictus. And if we would be able to manage that, just the last step above it, um, kind of the crown jewel of the entire underground world would be to organize a concert for Death Can Dance. And that's where the pyramid ended because anything above that was just not underground anymore. That was overground. Um, so, um, and that's that means kind of different different rules of the game. So uh, we finally, after having organized like seven or eight concerts, we actually managed to book within one autumn. Um, Death in June, Sol Invictus, and the Italian band Ordo Equitum Solis, which were really big at that point in time. I mean, this was kind of their year. And um, those concerts were all like three or four weeks apart from each other, in the middle of a really kind of harsh, harsh fall. Uh, it was snowing and it was almost winter. So the first of them was uh, Death in June. I mean, Death in June started as a trio originally. This was Douglas Pierce on guitar and uh, Tony Wakeford on bass guitar and on the drums Patrick O'Kill. And uh, Tony Wakeford was actually the first one to leave the band, uh, leaving them as a duo to start his own band Sol Invictus, which we had booked for like four weeks later. And only a few years later Patrick O'Kill left the band to start Sixth Com. And um, so Death in June at this point was basically Douglas Pierce and whoever he invited to the studio or on tour to play with him. When this whole thing was finally booked and started to appear in the local press, in the kind of concert announcements, um, Hans-Peter and Brigitte started to get all kind of uh, weird telephone calls in their office. And uh, so they went to a record store to finally look up who these uh, Death in June guys are. They were also puzzled by the detail that uh, for the first time we had a pre-sale of tickets and uh, these tickets were selling like crazy. 
So they finally went to a record store to look up Death in June. And uh, this was the album that uh, was uh, kind of fresh out of the press and uh, that they saw. They already gotten themselves into a complete tizzy because of Death in June and kind of yelled at us and, um, and uh, proclaimed that this is a right-wing band that takes the stance of the, of the Croatian Ustasha murder commands and whatever. Um, we kind of really didn't listen to them. This just went in one ear and out the other ear. And I was just saying, look, do you want us to cancel the concert? Now they were totally greedy, so I mean they knew that uh, the kachink is start starting to come in, and uh, they they were definitely not willing to cancel the concert. They wanted <laughs> they wanted their share, but uh, they also wanted to vent kind of their Marxist anger at us, and so um, we kind of took it and uh, thought like, yeah. Um, I guess uh, we have uh, just elevated ourselves into a kind of a new new uh, level of the game. And uh, yeah, and then the day came. And it was really bad weather outside, very cold. And uh, we were quite early in the, in the concert hall in the room, setting everything up. And uh, honestly, we were pretty, pretty nervous. Well, I was certainly nervous because... Uh, we kind of knew that uh, Douglas Pierce has a very kind of strong personality and probably can be a bit difficult as an artist and uh, so we were all kind of nervous and then finally Death in June arrived. And now Douglas was a impressive character and uh, indeed a dominant personality and um, but uh, what we did not expect is that he brought someone with him and that was Boyd Rice. Now Boyd Rice at this point in time was a artist whose name we prefer to whisper because uh, this was someone that you kind of feared and uh, if you look at uh, his imagery from the 80s you quickly understand why and uh, so it was fascinating we thought, like, we thought we won the jackpot because man Death in June was here, Boyd Rice was here, what else? So this was quite uh, amazing. We showed them the backstage. I mean, they had faxed us some hilarious riders uh, to the contract. So we had bought a lot of alcohol and a lot of uh, interesting food and drinks and whatever. So everybody was kind of happy camper. And then the audience started to arrive. Now, you must understand that this hall was basically built for 400 people. And uh, when we did a concert there, between Stefan and me we personally knew like 250 of those people. So this was kind of our scene. Those were people that we had seen for years, every weekend in the clubs we went to, in the concerts we attended, etc. So it has always been in some ways this kind of a familiar enterprise making these concerts. Uh, I think it was based kind of on the, on the notion that you are doing this for your kind of scene and much less for a commercial reason which indeed was the case because we never made any money from these concerts. Um, this went all in the pockets of Brigitte and Hans Peter. And um, but this evening, this night, all hell broke loose. I mean, this was mayhem. There were uh, probably eight hundred people there, which was twice as much as you could kind of put into the into the hall. So we were disturbed. We were quite nervous how this all will turn out. Uh, we started to feel that we kind of entering a slightly um, semi legal grounds because uh, this club, this room, this concert room was probably registered for a certain amount of people, and I think we were far over it. Um, now, there were things suddenly happening um, that uh, we did not expect. So, uh, in, in one minute I was called to the, to the women's toilets and uh, there was just this girl and uh, they were all telling me that she attempted to commit suicide. Um, now, the problem is I was 22 years old. I had no any kind of qualification to deal with things like that. So, um, I was really an asshole. To her because I just I was just this whole situation was just exploding in my head and I was just telling her you know what if you want to do it just do it but please don't do it here because we have so much to do and just do it outside and um, so probably not uh, the best way but uh, at the same time I 
was deeply convinced that she's just, well, just acting. And um, the same evening we had been uh, given the intel that there will be um, undercover police in the audience. Um, a lot of these people that came really suddenly looked very shady to us. I mean, this was not our scene anymore. This was something entirely different. There was this, there was just this explosiveness in the air. You kind of felt like you need one spark and something is going to happen. And suddenly we had to deal with problems like, do we still let people in or do we kind of turn people away? And um, it was, it was a tense situation. Now, uh, the problem, <laughs> the problem is that we were just naive kids and we were totally clueless about what it meant to invite death in June. We were just too far inside the scene to see the whole picture. So there was this band that was kind of touring through Europe and dragging this whirlwind of controversy and of uh, conflict and of uh, Antifa people organizing their rallies outside of the hall, trying to kind of cancel the concert and all those things. We just didn't know what hit us. And uh, I mean, just to put it in the context, there is something here in Germany that we call Verfassungsschutz, which is kind of a federal office tasked with the protection of the Grundgesetz, of the constitution, which means they are like an intelligence gathering body that uh, is focused on all extremist elements you can imagine, regardless if they are from the left, from the right, if they are religious, if, they are, if it's about sects, etc. And um, yeah, Death in June started to appear in their annual reports. Um, nothing fancy though, but um, yeah, this was suddenly, this was more an, of an issue than we personally, we two chumps just <laughs> understood at this point. So uh, this all kind of started to look like a giant avalanche that <laughs> was really breaking loose above us. And uh, I was sitting in the backstage with uh, Boyd Rice and Douglas Pierce and um, kind of started to talk about the audience and uh, now I don't know why I had to open my mouth instead of shutting up but when you are 22 many times you speak before thinking and um, yeah so I kind of started to talk about the audience outside and how bothered I was with these two guys and uh, it kind of turned into um, pretty sharp argument because I was kind of saying yeah we understand you we understand your music we understand what you're doing in terms of uh, uh, artistic expression and we understand kind of the ideological traps that you are setting for the audience to kind of entertain these impressions and ideas um, and um, their relativistic nature and whatever, but not everybody is really understanding that properly, I guess. And if you look now outside in the audience and the mayhem that's going on there, uh, I think uh, there are just a lot of people that uh, would probably need a bit of a guidebook to your music just to, just to get their heads straight. And they really, really freaked out, these two guys. So... Um, they really didn't agree with me and thought that this is just a completely stupid argument and they are, that I'm just basically throwing feces at their audience. And I was like, no, no, it's just, I, those are just kind of uh, uh, bad apples and blah, blah. And they were just, I mean, I just remember myself sitting there on this chair and uh, just kind of boiled rice <laughs> leaning over me, just screaming at me, you are judging books by their cover and you are wrong. You are the one with the problem here. And um, I, mean, I was this 22 year old kid <laughs> that knew nothing. And these two underground luminaries were just pounding at me verbally. And uh, at one point, uh, their tour manager just came in and just passed me by and he was totally upset with me. He was like, what the fuck are you doing? Shut the fuck up, man. Can't you, don't, 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 don't provoke them. <laughs> but I mean, the damage was done. And then a minute later, my buddy Bill came in and Bill was a good friend of ours. And I mean, he was just walking in and out the backstage area whenever he wanted. And um, he was... Uh, good friend he was actually from new york from brooklyn and but he lived in munich and still lives there 
And uh, I remember he just sat, sat down and listened to this argument for like three, four minutes. And then he kind of raised his voice and said, yeah, you know what? I'm with Alish here on this. And you know why? Because you can make your concert here, but then you move on to the next city and we have to live with this scum here. And <laughs> this was like pouring gasoline <laughs> into a fire. So uh, this was a hilarious, horrible situation <coughs> uh, where I was actually pretty depressed about the whole situation for long time. Well, not really depressed, but I was kind of saddened because I started this stupid argument and part of me always regretted this. Part of me wanted for years and decades to sit down and write a lengthy letter to Douglas Pierce just to express my regrets. Not because I was wrong, but because it's a pretty shitty thing to upset an artist 20 minutes before he has to go on stage. So um, not cool and not professional. And it bothered me for years, my weird, uh, traumatizing uh, Death in June story. I mean, the concert went by fine and everything was okay, more or less. And um, But uh, I was really, I was really slightly traumatized by uh, my encounter with Boyd Rice and Douglas Pierce. But interesting, uh, like five weeks later, we had Sol Invictus uh, performing... Uh, this was already the start of December, as far as I remember, and it was snow outside. And uh, uh, again, I was sitting in the same backstage room with Tony Wakeford, who is a very different character from Douglas Pierce, very different personality. Um, and um, um, yeah, they know each other very well because they were part of the same band at the beginning. They started Death in June together, and even on the later uh, Death in June albums, Tony Wakeford kept appearing. <laughs> And um, I kind of told him my story and uh, kind of slightly heartbroken and he was very amused and chuckling a little bit and he said, yeah, but what do you expect? It's Douglas. He's a poor misunderstood artist and uh, believe me, he, he tours into the next city and something like that happens again. It's, it's not as bad as you think. So uh, this kind of, um, I guess, redeemed me slightly. In the whole situation but um, yeah that was my death in June story this was a little glimpse of uh, the underground era of uh, the early 90s and uh, I don't know if you found this in any way interesting but uh, but I guess the interesting part is that I have not talked about this with anyone for well I guess 28 years and now you've heard it.